Hello and welcome to EGM 702 Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is Week 2, Part 4, LIDAR. LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. This is an active remote sensing technique that works on a similar principle to radar. So we have a sensor that sends a signal towards some target. The signal reflects off of the target, comes back to the receiver, and it's received by the receiver. And we can use the travel time, the amount of time it takes for the signal to go from the, from the sensor to the target, back to the sensor, to actually calculate the distance between the sensor and the target. Typically, LiDAR is using 600 to 1,000 nanome nanometer wavelength lasers. So these are wavelengths in ranging from the visible green portion of the electromagnetic spectrum up into the near infrared. And the wavelength of the sensor, much like what you discussed in EGM 713, is going to determine what we actually see or the properties of the signal, um, rather, that is returned by the target. So normally what this looks like is that we have a laser that is sending out a pulse or a, a lot of um, photons of uh, light at one time. And normally that means that we get returns from multiple targets. We don't actually have, we don't normally have a single target that returns back. We get lots of different signals that we need to try to, to process. So that looks a little bit like this. So we might see the returned echo showing how much, showing the signal strength as a function of time that is returned, which again corresponds to the distance between the sensor and the target. Uh, this might be quantized um, where we either see the, uh, the peak of each of these different signal returns, or we might also have information um, at more than one step along the way. So what this means is that we can use LiDAR to see things like vegetation cover. We might get returns from the surface of the water uh, or surface of water bodies and, as, and the bottom of water bodies, depending on the depth. Or we'll see returns off of the sediment that is suspended in the water. Um, there are lots of different things that we might be able to observe with this. We can use this to st do things like study vegetation structure and health because we can actually see what the canopy looks like uh, in terms of how much, um, in, in terms of its volume, uh, which tells us a little bit about the health of the vegetation. And we can also use it to sort of remove the vegetation uh, from our elevation models to create a digital terrain model where we're only seeing the, the ground surface without the vegetation or houses or other buildings on top. So a LiDAR system normally looks something like this, where we have our platform, we have our sensor that is sending out our signals, and then we have a number of other components that make up the system. So obviously the laser and the, or the detector, the laser and the detector is perhaps the most uh, important of these because this is how we actually send and receive the signals. Um, but we also need to have an inertial measurement unit, at least if we have a a sensor that's on a platform that's moving. And this allows us to actually be able to figure out what direction the sensor is pointing at any given time, which enables us to figure out the actual 3D position of the, um, of the targets that it's, uh, that it's observing. Now, the inertial measurement unit is measuring things like the pitch, so the rotation around the, usually the x-axis, the roll, which is the uh, rotation around the y-axis, and then as, as well the, um, the yaw, or the heading that the, uh, that the platform or the plane is flying. Uh, we also have a GPS or GNSS component so that we can actually get the 3D position of the sensor in time. And with the combination of the 3D position as well as the pointing direction, we can actually get the 3D location of all of the points that we're observing. And usually this also means we have some ground component, uh, either real-time kinematic GPS, RTK, or differential GPS, uh, where we have some GPS base station 
um, that we can do some post-processing on to get more accurate uh, GPS or GNSS locations. Uh, there are a number of different applications that you might see for LiDAR, and I'll talk about a few of them in the rest of this lesson. Uh, the first is in the field of urban forestry, and I hope that you will agree with me that trees are an important thing to have in urban areas. Uh, for one thing, they help mitigate the urban heat island effect, uh, they help support biodiversity in urban areas and in other environments, and they're also just nice. Field mapping trees in urban environments and in other environments can be quite difficult because you have to take a lot of different measurements for each tree that you find. Um, they can be spread out over a large area. It takes time to measure individual trees. So this is where LIDAR has been a really big help um, is in, in actually doing these field measurements or field mapping of trees. Uh, the combination of LIDAR and hyperspectral data can really aid classifying different trees. Um, so if you look at the example here, this is from a paper by Liu et al. in uh, 2017, looking at urban forestry in a, I think it was in Surrey, British Columbia. And one thing that uh, we see with the LIDAR data is that there is a very clear signature of each of these different types of trees. So we have Douglas fir, honey locust, Japanese cherry, and so on, and they all look quite different in the LIDAR data, which we can use in combination with the hyperspectral data to better classify or more accurately classify uh, the trees uh, in the urban environment. LIDAR, as I said, can also give different parameters like the height and the structure um, of the vegetation, which tells us something about the, the overall health of the vegetation. So this is a really, um, really useful technique that can help um, to do this kind of mapping, not just in uh, urban environments, but also in other environments. Um, another application for LIDAR is in uh, studying permafrost or coastal areas. Um, so this example paper here from uh, Obu et al. 2017 um, used repeat LIDAR surveys to study erosion of permafrost along the coast in areas of uh, northern Canada and I believe Alaska. Um, but ero erosion of permafrost coasts is a really big problem in the Arctic. So as um, as climate change is warming areas in the Arctic uh, quite drastically, um, but also as we have sea ice retreating uh, from the coastline for much of the year, uh, we end up with uh, quite a bit of erosion that happens uh, either because of thawing of permafrost or just because of increased wave action on the shore. Um, and this is something that's uh, quite important both for those local ecosystems but also for a global climate as a whole because as permafrost thaws more and more it has the potential to release more and more carbon uh, which can accelerate that um, that feedback loop of uh, of climate change so these processes are highly variable in both space and time and normally uh, without without having repeat LIDAR surveys like this, you might be able to look at the changes over multiple years or decades, um, but because of this, this high variation in space and time, it's good to be able to, to repeat, to easily or quickly uh, repeat these surveys to see how things are changing on a much shorter time scale. Um, so this is something that high quality, high resolution LIDAR surveys can help with. Um, and this is not necessarily limited to permafrost coasts. Um, we can also use LIDAR or laser scanning to study coastal change uh, in other environments as well. Another big application for LIDAR is in the field of archaeology. So I'm not, I, hopefully you, you have some appreciation for the fact that uh, being able to excavate the full extent of ancient monuments or cities can be quite difficult because in a lot of cases they've been buried or otherwise obscured for a very long time. Um, this is especially true in areas where we have very thick vegetation cover. Um, so this satellite image shows the uh, forests and vegetation of an area in southeastern Mexico. 
Um, and it's very difficult to see much there if we're just looking at the, the visible or even the near infrared um, images. But with LIDAR surveys, we can actually, as I said, uh, see through or see the ground underneath the vegetation, which can actually reveal uh, the extent of ancient cities or uh, large monument complexes. And so this example from a paper by Inamata et al. Uh, from last year um, used LIDAR to help reveal archaeological sites at a place called Awada Phoenix in Mexico, uh, which was built and then abandoned sometime between 1000 and 800 BC. And so with, uh, with LIDAR surveys that cover large areas, we have the potential to discover many more um, cities and complexes like this in areas where uh, more traditional remote sensing or more traditional field methods are quite difficult. I've talked a little bit about um, aerial surveys of, uh, of LIDAR, uh, but we can also use similar techniques from space. Um, the most prominent example of this is the Ice Cloud and Elevation Satellite from NASA, also called ISAT. Um, and the first ISAT satellite uh, was active from 2003 to 2009. It was a laser altimeter, so it, um, it measured the ground height underneath the satellite uh, at about a 70 meter footprint. So the, each measurement corresponded to an area about 70 meters in diameter, and each of these different footprints was spaced by about 150 meters along the satellite track. Um, so it's fairly sparse sampling, but it's still extremely accurate uh, and has been extremely useful for studying glaciers and ice sheets as well as sea ice. And in 2018, NASA launched ISAT-2, which is an update of the, uh, of the satellite. Um, and now instead of a single shot laser altimeter um, that has a very large footprint that's very sparsely sampled, um, ISAT-2 actually has uh, three different pairs of beams, so six total tracks that it's measuring along. Um, each of these different pairs is separated by 90 meters, and each of these, um, each of the, the, the spacing between each set of pairs is about three and a half kilometers, uh, if memory serves. So this is a lot more, um, a, a lot we see a lot more variation in the cross-track direction, uh, but in the along track direction, now instead of a measurement every 150 meters or so, we're getting a measurement every about 70 centimeters. And you can see what some of the early returns from this um, looked like. This is, um, this is an area, I believe, over the Gulf of Mexico um, that's looking at uh, a forested hill hillside that you can see as well as out over the ocean. And you can see that we're able to measure things like the actual tree heights, or at least estimate the actual tree heights from space, as well as looking at the ground elevation. We can also see the surface of the water. And in shallower areas, like in the outer parts of this lagoon, you can also see the bathymetry or the, the bottom of the um, you can see the bottom of the water here, uh, as well as actual ocean waves uh, as we get further out over the ocean. So this is an extremely accurate, extremely dense surveying method um, that is giving lots of information about a number of different areas uh, on a global scale. It's a very cool data set. So to sum all of this up, um, LIDAR is a technique for measuring the distance between a sensor and an object. It gives us highly accurate measurements, subject to some post-processing. Um, so as long as we have very accurate positioning and very accurate uh, pointing information, we can get very accurate measurements. Um, there are lots of different applications of LIDAR. Uh, I've shown examples from the cryosphere, urban forestry, and archaeology. Um, but that's certainly not, those are certainly not the only um, applications of LIDAR that you'll find. So a uh, number of different resources that you can look at here. Uh, the first is the um, remote sensing textbook that's available on Blackboard in chapter 10, section three, uh, has a whole, uh, that's, that's a whole section on LIDAR 
Uh, I've also uploaded the different papers uh, related to uh, this presentation. And you can go look at the ISAT2 mission page for more information about ISAT2. And I've included links to a couple of videos that uh, further discuss LIDAR and ISAT2. So that's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.